Hey folks, how we doing? Um, here to talk about position papers. So this is the second uh, of your written assessments in Social 30-1, right? Position paper. What happens with this assessment is you're going to be given a topic. You're either going to agree with it or you're going to disagree with it, right? The source takes a certain perspective and what you're going to do is tell me why you should or should not accept that source, right? And you do that by giving reasoned argument in terms of whether or not we should accept the source um, or, yeah, whether we should reject it, right? So with that being said, um, I put up for you a tips and hints guide and I just want to talk about the key aspects to this. Um, so yeah, assignment number two, as it says on the screen, um, students will analyze a source to demonstrate an understanding of the ideological perspective. Now, when you get a source, guys, what's going to happen here is the source takes a certain perspective and generally the sources are either economic or political in nature. And if it's economic, generally it's going to be like something regarding, you know, how to have the strongest economy. And some sources are going to be pro-capitalism. Some sources are going to be pro-socialism, right? Other topics will be political and it's going to be about government control, right? And how much control is the right amount of control for the government to have in society? Uh, how much economic control is the right amount of control in society. So you're going to read the source and you need to first understand what the perspective of the source is. And we'll go through together how to actually run through one of these in the uh, subsequent modules here. Now it says students will respond in essay form. So this is an essay. It requires an introductory paragraph. We call that the analysis of the source paragraph. It requires body paragraphs. So there's one, there's two, there's three, and then you'll have a concluding paragraph. So the structure of the essay, it will include five paragraphs. Your intro, right, which again we call the analysis of the source paragraph. Three body paragraphs, which are case studies, which further your position that you've come up with on the topic, and then a conclusion. Conclusions, we'll talk about it. Very simple, very quick. Restate thesis, retouch on main points, done, right? So students will respond in essay form to a question regarding the ideological perspectives reflected in a source. Students will establish, argue, and defend a position. Establishing, arguing, and defending a position all comes down to your thesis, right? Your thesis is your position on the topic. Your thesis is the driver of the essay that you are composing, right? It should be the central focus of what you do in this written assignment. Now, last point there, it says students will provide supporting evidence. The evidence students may have or use, sorry, uh, may be theoretical, historical, contemporary, and or current events focus. Now, one thing I want you guys to be sure of, as students in Social 30, right, you can use case studies from Social 9, Social 10, Social 11. You can use case studies from, you know, uh, historical documentaries that you've watched. You can use case studies from books that have evidence which uh, you think furthers your position. Any real evidence that you think furthers your position on this is totally fair game totally fair game you're not handcuffed to only using social 30 evidence so when you read a topic and you're like whoa that stuff we've learned about in social 20 last year i could use that and you can remember guys the essay topics in social 30 are formulated so as to basically be like an exit pass in social studies you're now in grade 12 and you've taken 12 years of formal education, let's see what you know, right? That's what we want to see here. Demonstrate what you know, and it doesn't have to be just from your social 30 knowledge. Now, there's four criteria as far as how you are marked in this particular 
assessment. There's six marks for what is known as the analysis of the source. Uh, that's the first paragraph. We'll talk about that. There's eight marks for argumentation, eight marks for evidence. Again, we'll talk about that. And then eight marks for communication. And we'll break all that down here. Okay. So don't worry about uh, understanding that as of this moment. Now, let me just scroll down a little bit here. Now, guys, when you go into the written assignment, you're going to get a box that has, you know, your source up top. And then it's going to say, to what extent should we embrace the ideological perspective reflected in the source, right? An essay in which you must, you must analyze the source and demonstrate an understanding of the ideological perspective. I'm going to show you how we actually write an analysis of the source paragraph. Um, second bullet says establish and argue a position in response to the question presented. So let's say you read the source and you're like, yep, I totally agree with that. That's fine, right? If that is your position, that is totally fine. You can agree with it. And then when you establish and argue, as it says right here, um, a position, your body paragraphs are going to support that position, right? That's the whole point here. And that, that position we're talking about, again, that's what we call your thesis. And then last bullet says, support your position and understanding by using evidence from your knowledge and understanding of social studies. And remember, folks, social studies is the study of society right it is the study of society what happens why it happens why people do things right history contemporary knowledge economics politics all these things factor into what social studies is so again any evidence that you think will further your thesis your position on the topic it is fair game to use, right? And even if it's evidence I've never heard of, what we do on the diploma floor is we'll look it up to verify whether it is factual, accurate, uh, and truthful, right? And that's totally fine. If I learn about something as I'm reading a student's position paper and I'm forced to look it up and I'm like, wow, this is totally right and it applies to the topic and it furthers their argumentation, kudos to you, right? Kudos to you. Okay, let's keep moving down here. So um, how do you handle the position paper? So, um, you know, if, if we were writing this in class, you're allowed to bring a dictionary and a thesaurus. I highly recommend, guys, that when you're doing this, you have a dictionary. What if there's a word in the source that you're not sure about? And what if your understanding of the perspective of the source is contingent upon your understanding of that word. And you're like, yeah, I think I know what this is. And then you just roll with it, but then you're wrong. What happens then? Well, then your understanding of the source is flawed and there's a very real possibility that you fail the paper. So if there's terms, words, things that you don't understand, right? As far as the language in the uh, source, then you look it up right? You look it up to verify that you know what the source is implying. Now, number two, it says generally we write in the third person. Use we should accept the source rather than I accept the source, right? So write in that third person we. Now, if you use an I statement here or there, it's not that big of a deal, but I think it's more effective if we talk or speak more generally, write more generally, and use the idea of we rather than I. Now, number three, remember the overall topic of Social 30 Guys is liberalism, this focus on freedom. So ensure that you understand what liberalism is and what it's not, right? And know what examples of liberalism are, classical or modern, and what isn't, fascism, communism, etc. right? Now, number four, the topic generally breaks down to one of two avenues, as I mentioned before, economic or government. And by government, we mean political, right? And guys, again, economically, it's gonna be about how do we have the most prosperous um, society? How do we ensure that people aren't poor? What type of economic system is the most beneficial for 
human beings, right? Now that's general, right? The topic's obviously gonna be a little bit more complicated than that, but I want you to be thinking about that. Think before you do this, what do I know about capitalism? What do I know about socialism? What do I know about communism, right? Left versus right economics, what do they believe, right? Uh, and then, you know, if it's a topic of government, which types of governments tend to be most successful? And the answer to that, guys, is governments where they allow their people to have rights and freedoms. Governments that adhere to constitutions and limited power. Now, why is that? Well, I mean, I'm hoping that as a student in Social Studies 30, grade 12, you should be able to articulate that at this time. And it all comes down to, folks, you know, where you allow people freedom and rights that are guaranteed by constitutions and where we have limited government that's not always telling you how to live your life, people tend to support those systems. And governments that are controlling, that remove rights and freedoms, those tend to be the nations where we see people rebel against the government. If you want your people to support your governmental system, give people what they want, which is freedoms within limits, of course, right? So it says, when you read the source, keep this in mind. Uh, sometimes the sources you could take as either economic or political slash government, right? So, and you can answer using case studies from both of those particular um, disciplines, both those ideas, right? Now, number five, uh, it says, read the source. So when you get that source, first thing you're obviously gonna do is read it. So it says, read the source and jot down your initial impressions on what you feel about the source. So guys, I want you to think when you get the source, what is the source implying? What does it suggest? What is it getting at? What is its perspective? Write that down. Write that down. Because again, at that point, after you understand that perspective, you have to think, do I accept this? or do I reject this? And to what extent do I accept it or reject it? Because you could totally accept it, you could totally reject it, or you could be somewhere in the middle, right? You could accept it, but, or you could reject it, but, right? And we'll talk about that in more detail. Now, 5B says, remember, the position paper is always going to force you to take a position on an issue. The source will have a specific position on an issue. And again, guys, don't get it twisted. Don't get confused here. Whatever the source's perspective is, you're free to agree or disagree. Just the exercise of the position paper is you telling me why that source should be rejected or accepted. That's it. Don't complicate it. That's all it is. Now, number six, I'm just gonna scroll down here. Number six says, uh, identify the ideologies present in the source. Uh, in this case, the potential of very specific ideologies being present occurs. So when you read a source, guys, right, and it's talking about, let's say, free economies and how free economies produce the most prosperity, that is pro-capitalism, write that down, right? That is anti-socialism, write that down. If you read a source and it's about politics or government and it's talking about how we need to limit freedoms, well, that's not liberal, right? That's socialist slash communist or that's fascist, right? That's not a liberal source. Um, so just guys, when you get these sources, right? Make note of any ideologies that you see in there. And remember, be more specific than simply liberalism, right? And again, guys, like the more specific you are when you write this paper, the better you're going to do. Now, number seven, if possible, identify after you get the source, key people, right? If it's pro-capitalism, Adam Smith, right? If it's about restricting rights and freedoms of people, Hitler, Stalin, um, right? Uh, other uh, examples of totalitarianism like Mussolini could be used. Um, so identify key people, key events, uh, understandings, dates, etc. that could be used in your analysis, right? And if you can identify some philosophers like Locke, like Hobbes, Rousseau, Montesquieu, Voltaire, Burke, 
Mill, Mark Smith, right? Guys, again, use them if you can, right? If you can use them, and sometimes the sources might not lend themselves to those philosophers. However, if they do and you use them, you'll do better than a student who does not. Now, number eight, it says identify the issue within the source. Remember, an issue is something that people commonly disagree on and there are always two or more perspectives on the issue. So it says, realize the text given will give you one perspective on a particular issue within the source. Normally you can frame this as the source is asking whether or not we should have a free economy, right? The source is asking whether or not we should allow uh, government to control our rights in the name of collective security, right? The source is implying that there are times where a socialist economy is more beneficial than a capitalist free market economy. The source suggests that whatever it's saying. So we want you to be able to put this into your own words. And once you read the source, right, be like, okay, this is capitalist. However, who would disagree with this, right? Well, who would disagree with a capitalist source? Well, a socialist or a communist and try to jot down why they would actually do that. Now, number nine, it says, identify the two generally opposing arguments on the sides of the source. Some would say this about the source. They would agree. Others would disagree and jot down why. I'm going to tell you this right now. Those two opposing sides, we want to see that in your analysis of the source paragraph, right? Where you demonstrate a holistic understanding of, you know, some would say this, others would say that that furthers my uh you convincing me that you get what the source is about you get the complexity of the source and you'll do better than a student who does not do that so underneath here it says there are some who believe this about the source because right there are some who believe that free economies are the path to prosperity because right? When you allow people to pursue their own economic security, they work and work hard in order to achieve prosperity. However, there are others who believe that an open laissez-faire economy just simply leads to economic disparity between those who win in the system and those who lose. And sometimes those people lose because they can't or don't have the means to get educated, to control the means of production, whatever it happens to be. So guys, that's what this is getting at. So it says you must do this to demonstrate that you understand the complexity of the issue. And yes, issues are complex. There's always a wide range, a wide variance of um, perspectives on an issue, right? Demonstrate that you get the two general opposing sides of that issue that you're presented. Now it says, once you've identified the issue, identify your position. Now that you've broken down the source, you've identified ideologies, you've identified the two sides who would agree, who would disagree, what's your position, right? Now at this point, you are ready to come up with your position, your thesis on this particular source. Now it says, this generally breaks down as follows. We must agree with the source because, right? Or we should agree with the perspective of the source because, and that because is your thesis, right? That is the driver of everything you write. Now, B says we must disagree with the perspective of the source because we've had sources in the past uh, from the government, which are basically saying, you know, we need to have totalitarian government. And I can't imagine how anyone in the right mind would agree with that, right? So yes, disagreeing with the source, the perspective of the source is a viable option depending upon what the source is, right? Again, you gotta read it, you gotta figure it out. Now C says we must agree with the perspective of the source, but, right? Yes, we should agree with it most of the time, but here are circumstances where we don't. Some issues are complex like that. And again, that's up to you to decide whether the source that you're given is one of those issues. And then D says we must disagree with the perspective of the source, right? 80% of the time we should disagree with this source, with the perspective of the source, but 
we need to consider this as well. Okay, um, so it says, remember, issues aren't always black and white. There may be some gray in between the two of uh, the two polar opinions on the issue. So again, guys, I mean, I can't, you know, magically dump into your brain what you should be seeing in the source. I can't magically write your position paper for you. This is what separates social studies students who are strong from those who aren't as strong. Your ability to look at the source, determine what's going on in it, and then uh, determine the perspective and then coming up with a position as to why we should agree or disagree and to what extent we should agree or disagree. Totally agree, totally disagree, or somewhere in between, right? And that's all up to you. Now, uh, number 11 says, uh, identify the issue or sorry, identify the arguments you will use. Um, so after you come up with your thesis, right? I don't agree with this or I do dis or I do agree with this. Then jot down your case studies. What would I use to substantiate my position? How am I going to convince Mr. Crosby that my position on this topic is the right one to have? Uh, and then number 12, uh, within your understanding of the identified issue and your opinion uh, slash position on the issue and your arguments, right? You now can start writing your first paragraph. So guys, as you can see, numbers one through 11 above here, uh, this document that I'm going through, you're going to do all this before you actually start writing your position paper. At least I think it's a good idea. Um, and now overall, guys, this should take, right? Uh, the government says 90 minutes, uh, you will get three hours, right? You will get three hours. Now, does it need to take three hours? I mean, three hours is with double time. Um, so no, it does not have to take three hours. In general, I think about two hours for a uh, five paragraph uh, position paper, keeping in mind that that last paragraph, your conclusion is quite short, right? And we'll talk about that. Um, Two hours should be more than enough. To be honest, even an hour and a half, like we're talking about four paragraphs and your three source analysis is four paragraphs as well. I don't really consider the conclusion uh, or concluding paragraph to be that onerous and that difficult because you're just restating your thesis, retouching upon your three pieces of evidence and you're done. It's like four or five sentences. That's it, right? That's it. Now, general tips and hints. This is not a history paper, right guys? Don't get bogged down in trying to overwhelm me or overwhelm me with uh, history that you think is gonna demonstrate how wise and how scholarly you are. No, this is a position paper. I don't need you to get into historical narrative about Lenin and the Bolsheviks and all the things that they did, right? Uh, Red Terror, uh, NEP, you know, any of these things, Russian Civil War, Reds versus Whites, right? I don't need you to get into history that isn't relevant to your argumentation. And if you do, I'm going to circle your writing and just write historical fluff. So please make sure, guys, that you're not just trying to overwhelm me with all the stuff that you know. Everything that you say in your position paper should be to further your position, your argument, your thesis when it comes to the paper. Now, number two says everything you say should be to add to your argument. So Two and a half pages of succinct argumentation is much better than four pages of meandering, winding, non-poignant discussion, right? Number three, stick to the issue and proving why your position on it is superior, right? Stick to the issue. Uh, number four, when you're done, right, if you have extra time, reread it. Go through it again and make sure that what you're saying is what, or what you said is your intention, right? And as you read it, if you're like, oh, that could be better, then edit it before you hit that submit button, right? Guys, it takes a lot of discipline after you've written for, you know, two hours to take another 15 minutes to reread it and actually touch it up and make it better. But that 15 minutes, that 20 minutes, that half hour maybe, right, could be the difference between getting a S and a PF or a PF and an E. So make sure you take that time if you have it. If you don't, that's just how life goes. But if you do, why not use it? Right? This is the last one. Uh, and then number five, stick to the issue, right? Stick to the issue. Everything you say should be focused on the topic, period. 
That's it. And then number six, remember trial lawyer mode. Advocate as to why your position is the best. And you may also, as you're doing that, expose the flaws of contrary arguments. And we'll, we'll show you how that works out as I go through another example. Okay. Um, yeah, that was long. I apologize. 25 minutes, but I want to make sure that these things are sinking into your gray matter between your ears and behind your eyes. So anyways, guys, um, Hope life is doing well for you. Uh, I miss you all. Peace. Stay safe. And we'll talk to you later.